okay, take two here. It's Sunday night. And that means it's Sunday night service. And I'm Danny Williamson. And this is Dr. Robert Whitfield. I'll get his name up there soon. Um, I am thrilled to death to have him on with us tonight. World renowned, for sure, nationally renowned surgeon, plastic surgeon in Austin, Texas. But as you guys are logging on, tell us where you're from. Put your questions up, hit your heart button so that I can see you. And while you guys are logging on, I am going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Whitfield and his philosophy. I'm excited you're here tonight. Thank you. By the way. All right. Dr. Whitfield, he's an experienced, he's a board certified plastic surgeon. Completed six years of surgical training at Indiana, Indiana University, and he also remained there for, to complete his plastic surgery residency. And at that completion, he chose to gain additional training in microsurgery. I don't even know what that is. And aesthetic surgery by completing a one-year fellowship in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is actually where you're from, correct? Yes. Ah, oh, yeah. With Dr. William Zamboni. I don't know who that is. I know about the Zamboni machine on the <laughs> on the ice, but I don't I don't know Dr. William Zamboni, but he must be pretty fancy if you studied under him. He yeah. is an active member of the American Society for Reconstructive Microsurgery, the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Sur Plastic Surgery. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and the American Medical Association. And he looks about 32 years old to me. How in the world he's done all this, I'll never know. But here's the beauty of Dr. Whitfield. He focuses on providing clients with nutritional guidance, nutraceutical advice, personal genetic predisposition screening, very important, non-invasive, minimally invasive, and surgical options for treatments all over the body. He has completed over 4,000 breast procedures since 2004, probably more now because this was off of his website, mm -hmm. and over 500 implant removals. He has the largest series of explant specimens with PCR testing. And we're going to talk about that tonight. While serving as the president-elect of the Research Foundation, he gave testimony at the FDA at the FDA hearings in 2019 regarding breast implant illness. I watched those. I those were on those were live. I think yeah. yes, I watched those. I'm going to read you Dr. Whitfield's philosophy statement. This is off of actually. I think this is off his website. Choosing to have surgery is a major life choice. Dr. Whitfield has personally been involved in helping make decisions about surgery since, two, since 1992, when his sister was diagnosed with breast cancer. Each patient has to know the risks and the benefits so that they can make an informed decision. With the proper plan and meticulous attention to detail, each patient has the best opportunity for successful outcome in his hands. Patient safety is incredibly important to, to me, to him, and at the forefront of each surgical decision that is made. After spending so many years training and practicing, I only try to provide the safest and the most appropriate surgical care. I'm telling you, this guy is the real deal. And I met him just three weeks ago in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, somebody came up and said, you need to meet uh, Dr. Whitfield. I know you're passionate about breast implant illness. And I know you guys are so excited for us to get talking tonight and put your questions up here. Share this with your tribe. But I also want you to know everyone that's watching, I want there to be kindness. I want you to be gentle and I want you to show grace to people because you know, maybe if someone's asking a question or they have breast implants and you think breast implants are ridiculous and all of that, I just want no negative comments because I'm going to tell you, I know for a fact from my patients, there are many reasons other than just cosmetic or just I want larger breasts for women to get breast implants. I mean, some women, I mean, they could be, have been burned. They could have been in a fire. They could have had a horrible accident. I mean, there's lots of reasons that women get breast implants. So I want to learn tonight from someone who's an expert at this. And I want us to be kind and I want us to lift each other up. 
um, and those that are struggling. So apparently, Holly, we'll read yours a little bit later here about this. But uh, Dr. Whitfield, welcome tonight. And thank you for taking time out on a Sunday evening to talk you, to Dan. us. Give it's us a, a little bit. Tell us, um, um, tell us a little bit about how you got started in this. What is your how did you how did this become a passion for you? Sure. It goes back to my plastic surgery training. Um, I very much wanted to focus on oncology. And so I immersed myself in doing that extra year of training for oncologic reconstruction using microsurgery. So that's really taking small, think of like coffee stirrers that are two millimeters on either end and sewing them together using suture finer than your hair using an operating room microscope. So that's what I did for the better part of a decade. So I take the tissue from a woman's abdomen that's usually discarded in a tummy tuck, that leave it connected to the blood vessels and perform basically a living transplant to the chest after a woman had mastectomy either on one side or both. So that was basically a large majority of what I did. Um, I also did head and neck cancer reconstruction and sarcoma reconstruction. So that experience shaped how I took care of every single patient with a breast issue, whether it was a reconstructive patient who needed um, reconstruction after a lump lumpectomy or a mastectomy. Um, and then I also did cosmetic surgery. So I would do um, rejuvenation after pregnancies. Um, so patients who got implants from me were basically treated how I would treat all of my oncologic patients. So there's a very strict protocol in the operating room. Um, there's a very strict follow-up process. So fast forward um, many, many years later, I, I left teaching and moved to uh, a private practice job uh, in Austin. And I continued my same you know, work. And then uh, a breast cancer patient who had relocated from the South, uh, which many people retire in Austin now, um, looked me up and she came to me. She had had a breast reconstruction for several decades and um, she is retired and her and her husband were living on the lake here and she just didn't want to have a reconstruction anymore. And so, you know, there are lots of reasons that are more um, internal and I, I'd never tried the question why someone wanted or, or didn't want to have their reconstruction. You know, I just tried to do the best to help them, you know, in whatever way we could. So. I, she had a large amount of documentation about heavy metals and, and things and, and testing. And she was the first person, this would have been 2016, who asked me to perform an in-block capsulectomy. So for those who don't understand in-block, right. in-block means taking everything out. And it's a pathology term. And it's a term we use in cancer resections a lot because we don't want to disturb the tumor. So I did a lot of reconstruction for oncology. So when she asked me to do it, I was like, yeah, I mean, obviously I can do that. I hadn't been ever asked that, but I, I did it that way. And she had to have her case performed at a hospital because she had a, um, a condition which she needed, needed to be monitored overnight for, for her cardiologist. So I did her case in a hospital. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with how labs are done in hospitals or in everyday clinics, Laboratories are called CLIA-based labs that are in hospitals and in everyday clinics like Quest and LabCorp and CPL and all these things. So traditionally, you would take what looks like uh, a cotton swab, a Q-tip swab, and swab the pocket or take a small amount of tissue out of the pocket to send it off to always make sure that whether um, you're concerned about a cancer, if there was something abnormal, or you're concerned about infection. I did this on every single case when I was removing implants and capsule. So that way you know exactly what was there at that moment you did that procedure. So I did that because um, that's the way I always did oncologic uh, procedures where I was taking out devices and capsule and things. When her samples came back, she had an E. coli infection. Now, that's very different than what I do now. I'm telling you, she had an E. coli infection. Now, I personally didn't do her reconstruction, but I personally examined her both at her consultation and her preoperative appointment, and she had nothing on her examination, uh, no signs of any infection. Her number one problem was fatigue. That was it. 
she didn't have a rash. She didn't have arthralgias. She was significantly fatigued. And so I was really taken back by the results. Um, uh, it, it kind of, it raised my awareness level to something that I, were, I really didn't have before. Because if you can have an occult of infection, and obviously I feel like I understand what's going on when I examine people, I've been doing it for a long time. Um, I treated her with antibiotics per the sensitivities recommended by the hospital lab. And within, you know, a few weeks, I saw her post-operatively. She was doing better in a month. She was like a totally different person. So for someone to carry around an infection like that and not have any overt signs of it was pretty concerning. So I don't know if it was her or a comment she made, but somebody listed me somewhere and I started getting patients referred to me. Um, and so I started doing these, but because you're all, I mean, everybody's shaped by their experiences, whether it's in life or for me in surgery and how you react to situations. So that was a experience that has a lot of weight in my background because I would have never understood she had an infection because I didn't have a way to know that. There was no laboratory test abnormalities. There was no physical findings. Her only symptom was fatigue. So even the best clinician would not just magically say, assume that she had an infection because there's no way to know that. Now, maybe nowadays I would have checked her IL-6 and her IL-beta and I would, have, I would have thought about it differently. But I also now am much, much more aware of what to look for. And, and I, don't, I don't think that I'm going to miss that ever. Um, so that was really what shaped it. And then be, beyond that, I kept using and you'll hear me reiterate this over and over, a CLIA-based lab. So that was a hospital-based lab. And then most of these are done at surgery centers, not hospitals. She was a right. cancer patient when I used to do <clears throat> mostly oncologic reconstruction, and I had insurance contracts, and I worked out of hospitals. And basically, uh, as, as time went by, and it became harder and harder to do that, uh, when I went into solo practice, I did more and more at surgery centers and less and less at hospitals and the laboratory results became more and more variable where I had a particular client travel from New Orleans to see me and I was convinced she had a bad infection and both on exam, extreme fatigue, kind of swollen breasts and I did her operation. There was a tremendous amount of of just residue in the pocket and it wasn't ruptured to me it was just biofilm and so i went out to her husband and i was like you know she is going to get better i found this and i'll just wait for this to come back but i, I feel good that this this will take care of it and this was very early in my experience and it came back nothing Ooh. and so i was like oh this is not a me problem this is a lab problem mm. this is a sensitivity issue they're unable to, using their methodology, tell me what's going on. So then we searched around and the lab that initially identified anaplastic large cell lymphoma related to breast implants was out of Lubbock. So I got in touch with them from a colleague uh, referral and I started using that lab. So since it took me a while to get it organized, but since February 14th of 2019, every single explant specimen has PCR testing. So predominantly in those first 200, about 60 to 70% had biofilm, and that predominantly was cutie bacterium acnes. So a lot of times things are written on the internet that there's mold and all these other things, and that's incredibly uncommon, actually. I only have five out of, you know, 389 that have any kind of fungus. So it's predominantly bacterial. So I, I in my head, I wrap it around, okay, 60 to 70 percent give or take the time we're checking my audit of samples they have a quote-unquote bacterial or fungal predominantly bacterial problem so i checked the box and i feel like okay now that's definitely good i know that that was there now i can counsel the patient um, based on how we take care of it in the operating room they don't need to be placed on post-operative antibiotics because you wouldn't know what to treat them with anyway 
And a lot of times that causes more gut trouble. I have a ton of people, especially women, were put on Accutane and antibiotics as kids for acne. Just stupid, but it was done a lot. Uh, leads to leaky gut and just absorptive issues. So we try not to ever treat anybody postoperatively with antibiotics. Um, so ba basically, you know, when you're when you're doing this now, I have to think of this other like we discussed it a little bit. This twenty to thirty percent of of my clients who I don't have the answer for that, but there's a a company <laughs> that coincidentally I met with in Scottsdale, and we'll we'll just give the big overview of, of what they've figured out with respect to breast implant illness. And so I always said in 30% that I couldn't explain that you had a genetic predisposition to something. I don't know what it is, but it's a SNP or it's, it's something. So everybody knows about MTHFR from randomly going through things on the internet. It's a methylation gene. Um, it's predominantly, uh, you know, tested for now, I think it's more well known and, and people are aware of it. But that's just one methylation gene in a series of probably eight or 10 methylation genes. So you can have perfect MTHFR and still have methylation problems if you're just checking that one gene. Right. Secondly, we all have heard about the benefits of glutathione for, you know, beauty and detoxification and all these things so <clears throat> many many people have problems just with their glutathione metabolism in general so i never ever give any of my patients a glutathione iv um predominantly because i've had patients come to me from other practitioners having been having uh, received glutathione and gotten sick and been in bed for a month because if you don't have the actual copies of the genes to metabolize glutathione, glutathione will scavenge your own vitamins and minerals and make it so you basically are unwell from that infusion. Because that's what it does. If it, if it doesn't have a way to be metabolized. And then finally, we talked about it briefly, just the oxidative stress that everybody in North America is under on a day-to-day -day basis, a day-to-day -day basis from both the environment, you know, personal, uh, your home, your, your work environments, creates a lot of mitochondrial stress. And if your mitochondria aren't functioning properly, you'll build up and build up more oxidative metabolites. And then that poor or that dysfunction becomes compounded and maybe something as simple you know, not as simple as the, the implant really tips that and makes that burden so strong that they can't overcome it. So, you know, in summary for me, I feel very comfortable with that, whether we call it 50 to 70% are going to have biofilm and this other 30% are going to be the genetic predisposition that I always thought was part of it, but couldn't really identify it, didn't know the SNPs or didn't have a clear understanding. I think as we, you know, move forward, you know, my patients in particular will be able to use some genetic screening to look at their ability to handle oxidative stress, glutathione metabolism, and the methylation pathways so that we'll better be able to understand, you know, how they'll react. But universally, my patients get better because if the implant is the source of the stressor, removal alone will improve that. And then working with a practitioner like yourself to manage their other issues, either through, you know, nutrition or nutri nutraceuticals, you, you can help get that person better. <clears throat> exactly. So a lot, of, so the SNPs that I had read about, but I don't know for sure. You may or may not know this. DR53 cannot tolerate any silicone in the body at all. I, I don't know exactly about that. I was reading about this, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, how many people really check their genetic SNPs before they have breast implants? I don't know of anyone who's ever done that. Yeah, I, I would, you know, I haven't done hardly any primary augmentations. One, I don't like operating on young people. I, I don't yes. think they're equipped to make good decisions. So I don't do that. I never have really. The youngest people I ever operated on were in their 20s who unfortunately had genetic predispositions to cancer. So okay. I, I never did basic 
20 year old augmentation patients. That wasn't anything I ever did. So uh, you wouldn't have screened even the cancer patients. And these are all things that will, you know, through the genome project and better understanding of basically what the genome project left on the table. So they figured a bunch of things out and then there's all of this other stuff that they still are going through and, and learning, you know, specific things about. So I think, you know, for us, we're at a unique time where we are gaining, you know, understanding of this and it's a pretty complicated problem. I think um, I didn't discuss, uh, like I look at every, every woman's hormones because if you don't do that, you're, you're just, you're even further up a creek, you know, with a, their oxidative stress or their methylation or their glutathione metabolism. So anybody who's peri or postmenopausal, I'm always just checking all of that to make sure that that's in order because they won't recover properly if you haven't addressed their nutrition, um, you know, their nutraceuticals and their hormone balance. Otherwise, you know, you'll stay swollen longer. You'll be fatigued longer, irrespective of what I do or how good I do it in the operating room. Absolutely. So for those of you guys that are watching, I think there are around 313,000, somewhere around there, 313,000 implants in 2018 were put in, which was an increase of about 4% from 2017. Not everyone has breast implant illness. So just know that. I have a good friend down in Sarasota, Florida. She just turned 65. She's had two sets of implants, She's been fine, but she saw me do two different Sunday night services on breast implant illness. And she went to her surgeon, actually the one who put them in probably 15 years ago. Anyway, she just had them removed, long story short, and she felt fine. She feels so much better. She already felt good. She had no health problems. This woman didn't. But yeah. she said, Danny, I feel so was you know she just felt heavy apparently and she didn't right. realize it um interesting i've had many patients have their breast implants removed i've never had one patient tell me i wish i hadn't have done that isn't now, that something the only folks that so i've done so many now the red flag is the tiny girl comes in or, or tiny gal with little ones and She's was too little, didn't have any tissue, and they put too big of implant in her. Now, when you remove those, that creates a psychological problem with body image. It's not that they don't feel better, but they don't look better. And their their behavior and psychology changes extremely um, and sometimes very badly. And so I try to make sure that I never prop this up as this. I'm going to magically um i can't make you better looking you know i can make you feel better and i'm one of the few people who does immediate fat transfers because i've done those for cancer patients for a number of years on my website when you look at it there's people who, who have better looking breasts than when they started because of the technical advances in breast reconstruction so i try to identify those clients that are really going to have a aesthetic outcome that is, is going to be poor and run the risk of getting better, but feeling psychologically worse. Correct. So. My uh, best friend from high school had hers in for 29 years and she had them removed last year, I suppose. The surgeon told her, said, you, you've only got about 10% breast tissue, if any. They right. are going to be tiny, if not concave-ish. Right. Right. And can't prove breast implants did that. She also had a stressful marriage. You know, there's lots of things uh, th that bring on autoimmune disease, but she feels sort of anything done afterwards. She feels so much better without them. She still has MS, but I can totally see that. She was a little worried about that. And I was worried about the, her husband. I wondered how he would react. I mean, you know, the spouses, that's a big thing. I think that, do you address that and talk to the spouse? Because I mean, there's a lot of men who like big boob, big right. chested women. Well, ultimately I've had people uh, be left after this. Um, women get left 
get divorced. And so, you know, we take a very um, a positive light on that. And if I say if that is the issue, and I've had it happen with breast cancer patients, too, that were left having mastectomies to be alone and fend for themselves. So good riddance. Disgusting... Don't let the door hit you in the ass is all it's, I can say. It's a disgusting situation. So if they're going to do that, then they're not worth having around, honestly. Amen. So I, we just try to be supportive in that. And, you know, I, I hope that as we go along here and COVID, you know, dies down a bit uh, and, and it's easier to deal with things, we'll bring on more health coaching and more, you know, life coaching resources for clients. I, I've not had the ability to do that. And my bandwidth is pretty narrow based on how much I already do. Exactly. So for those of you watching who have breast implants and are a little curious about this, I'm, I'm watching these comments pop up and there's a whole lot of you that have had them removed already. But tell us what your symptoms were um, or are here, because I can tell you what my patients tell me. I mean, my patients talk to me all the time about this. Now, some on new patient paperwork. I have a section that says, do you have breast implants? Because I missed this. And this is like two, two years since I've had this on there. It's unbelievable to me how many of my autoimmune patients have breast implants. So it's, right. it's fairly new for me to have on my radar, kind of like adverse childhood experiences. Right. You know, I now have all the new patients fill out an ACE questionnaire. But here's some of the symptoms that my patients have reported to me. And while you guys are putting this up as well, fatigue, low energy, cognitive dysfunction, brain fog, memory right. loss, headaches, joint pain, muscle pain, hair loss, recurring infection, swollen lymph nodes, uh, rashes, uh, problems with thyroid and adrenals, chest pressure, shortness of breath. Shoulder pain. I have a 60. I bet she's 66 years old. She had hers removed, 67 maybe. She had shoulder pain. She woke up in the recovery room with no pain, no shoulder pain. And Dr. Bergdorf, who's a plastic surgeon here in town, he oftentimes, man, my chest pressure is gone or my numbness and tingling is gone while they're still coming out of anesthesia. I mean, do you hear that? So those many of what you described, especially with pain, both neck and upper back and arm and shoulder, those are mechanical symptoms usually due to weight. And so when you remove the weight, it's well documented, both in reduction studies done where I trained in Indiana, that you'll get increased uh, lung function, but you'll diminish upper cervical and upper thoracic pain. And so that's a real, that's an easy win for someone if they come in to me and they say, you know, I've got tons of problems with my, my back and my neck and posturally they sit like this and they're hunched over and then they have, that triggers migraine. So a lot of folks have migraine. Oh. Um, I've had people, I'll, I'll give you some of the more esoteric or, or odd things that I've seen. Um, so I think complicated migraine relief always shocks me when I see it go away. Um, but I've seen that resolve. Um, some specific things that are a little bit odd have to do with the reproductive system in females. So I've had people start cycling who hadn't cycled for years. Had a period, I've, ladies. Had a period. Yeah. And and then the the I've had really women come to me really embarrassed about bacterial vaginosis and fungal uh, vaginosis that was refractory to anything. And so there's also been examples of refractory proctitis, athlete's foot. So these to me are just symptoms of autoimmunity gone haywire. So the, yes. the last thing it can deal with is, you know, someone's toe. I had a lady who came to me, I swear to God, she said, I want you to take care of my athlete's foot by giving me Botox in my toes. And I looked at her and I knew she had breast implants. And, and I said, um, do you have any other medical problems? She said, yeah, yeah. Just a, a gal in her late twenties, early thirties. She's like, I have 
uh, proctitis, but I've worked on my diet and I've got it under, you know, control. And I looked at her and, you know, she has breast implants and I'm like, how old are you? Or, or I'm sorry. Cause I don't, I would never ask that. I, I said, you know, what other surgeries have you had? What have you had done surgically? Oh, you know, I've had breast implants. I'm like, how old are they? And she said, oh, they're 12 years old. I had them when I was, you know, in my teens or something, 19, 20. I said, oh, you know, those aren't lifetime devices. And probably what you have now, this is a very, very, this is where you have to be a little bit detective when you're me and you take what the person's environment was like, and then you postulate how they could have got inoculated with bacteria to then contaminate their implant. Because not everybody starts out with a contaminated implant. That's not how this works. So I've got high-end trainers. I've got triathletes. I've got Spartan racers. I've got everything in between. You can get a cold and infect your implant. This is no different than somebody getting a blood-borne infection and infecting their knee or hip implant. And that's very um, difficult to manage on the orthopedic side. Now, None of these things are really complicated, but this gal had worked as a very, very high-end trainer in gyms all of her young life. Do you know what's in a gym every day? Just the grossest thing. It's basically a public toilet. Uh. So how, how often before COVID do you think gyms were terminally cleaned? If, if you want to know what terminally cleaned is, that's what we do to operating rooms at the end of a case is we, we clean the operating room. So this person i guarantee has an extremely heavy burden of biofilm on their implant which is leading them otherwise healthy to have a refractory case of athlete's foot that would make any pro athlete scared wow. and proctitis which obviously proctitis is a pretty big deal so these are all autoimmune you know mediated issues it, it, once you take away the stressor the person will be able to to get better and then then you have to give it to someone like danny to figure out what to do with all the other elements that they need sorted because as as you can hear from me i've got the majority of the front and and plastics care and post-op care sorted but these can be six month nine month 16 month processes that are out of the scope of what I can do for a given client. I try to make sure I give them plenty of resources and I have a nutritionist who does care for BII patients, but a lot of people don't embrace that, that aspect of it, which is, you know, as important, if not more important to your long-term health than what I'm going to do. You bet. You bet it is. You bet. It doesn't end just with the, uh, with the X plant. I'm going to start at the top. Actually, what does refractory mean in this context? And what I just said. Refractory. Oh, um, the, in the in the infections. OK, so someone who keeps having bacterial vaginosis or fungal vaginosis that antibiotics don't solve and they oh. repeatedly test and culture and it comes back. Just imagine if this young lady who's got, this gal had two little kids and every week was at the OB with a bad candidiasis infection. And so much so that they cultured it and it was multi-drug resistant candidiasis. This is something you see in ICUs. You don't see it in a vagina. Yes, absolutely. Okay, look here. Holly, my mom and I were just talking about this, looking up your video on Instagram on implants and your live just popped up on this subject. Could be divine intervention. Okay, she was told on Thursday that her silicone implant ruptured. She's 75. So we have to figure out her next steps. Oh, Holly, I'm sorry. Holy cow. Yes, you do have to figure out your next steps. 75 years old. Isn't that something? Um, Typically would be above the muscle and more simple to do. So that's not as hard as it sounds. Okay. 
but find a good surgeon anyway if you want to remove those. Yes, and we'll talk about that after. So Karen says, BI is very real. Nine autoimmune disorders. Had my explant in September. Karen, I hope you're feeling better. I do. Pat says, this is so important, this information on breast implant illness. I have suffered with this for almost 15 years. I was told I was crazy. Yes, I was treated for Lyme multiple sclerosis, and I finally decided to do my own research. I have so much going on with my health. I can write it all. I can't write it all down. I explanted in 2018. I'm still on the journey to heal my body. I had saline textured that had ruptured. Okay. Whoa. So well, before you move on, I'm going to say something about textured devices. Okay. So Textured devices cause far more inflammation than non-textured devices. So texturing increases the surface area by which your body can interact with the device, or in my case, biofilm can attach to it, increasing the bio burden. So I've seen the worst cases in textured implants, and I've had two people have cancer with textured implants. You cut out on me. What did you just say? You've seen the worst cases of what? The, the worst cases of BII I've had have, have been in folks with textured implants. Two people with cancer. I'm trying to read it on the, uh, okay. For some reason you did cut out. I don't know. Yeah, I, I did know. have, I've had two people with cancer. One breast Which, and one uh, a uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Which is, you do have a higher rate of that with the textured ones. Is that what you uh, testified on Capitol Hill about? No, I was, because uh, I was president elect, they wanted to address the, you know, what are we doing? What are we going to do to, to help, you know, try to solve the issue? And then when I became president, we funded several projects, but then COVID happened. So those projects never could actually take off. Goodness. Um, are insurance companies paying for removal surgery of silicone implants? I have developed leaky gut and an autoimmune disease, and I have nerve pain daily and take Lyrica. Does so insurance ever pay for this? So I think there are efforts to to get it done that way. Um, prior to COVID, I had terminated, you know, the majority of my insurance contracts because they weren't paying me to do breast reconstruction. Um, so I've helped people um, to a limited, not very many have been successful, get it on uh, reimbursement on the back end after things have been done and you can demonstrate, oh yes, I had biofilm or oh yes, I had um, you know, a uh, capture contracture or I had a ruptured device or, or something like that that maybe they can use then as uh, information, but it's so far not great. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Oh, yeah, Dorinda, look at that. Dorinda says, that's right. Don't let the door hit you in the tail. Bye, boy. Amen to that. Amen to that. Uh, fatigue. Tammy had fatigue. Yeah. Important topic. Absolutely. And, you know, Dorinda, fatigue, neck, joints hurt. You probably should consider this. Dorinda's from Paducah, from my hometown area so look at this one right here diagnosed with lupus and arlay uh, um uh, all right darlene did you have yours removed i can't remember what you said and then this depression even after the implants have removed and i don't know janelle when yours were removed um but the gut and the brain are also 100 percent connected and so when you heal the gut i watch my patients begin to start to heal their depression or decrease their anxiety or their add or their adhd am i correct on this yes that's um one of my biggest challenges is taking someone who has um and i'm not trying to be critical of groups uh on you know whether it's on uh, some of the larger sites or facebook but Posting things where the patient magically, everything gets better is misleading. Amen. Uh, You're right. You know, and there's a huge group on there. You know, bre what is it? Breast implant illness. Healing breast implant illness. Healing by Nicole. She's got a gigantic community. You know that, right? There's some amazing things on there. And there's some 
not so amazing things, right? Look at you. I can tell by your face. So, but you know, people are desperate, Dr. Whitfield. They are, they are desperate. And I think, I think you have to take the bad with the good with that. And I tell people, look, look now they, these people are sick and they're sharing everything out there and i mean you just have to take a lot of that with a grain of salt as i tell them and and i believe them when people say they're sick i believe that oh yeah, yeah. because yeah, i look at that group and i i don't ever comment anything at all because they don't want as a provider on their comedy but i i i could say a lot of things about that um can you scroll down to michelle blakenship's comment that's an important comment yeah, where are you? Uh, there's so many comments. We may not be at, uh, if they were removed, but was told they couldn't remove the capsule, are they still at a risk for the same problems? Yes. Michelle's another Paducah girl. Oh, we got Paducah represented on here tonight. So really? I'll, I'll, so I'll, what do you do? Yeah, so I was telling you that patient story. So a yes. patient came in to see me recently, two years of really significant autoimmune system uh, dysfunction, seen every practitioner under the sun, including oncologist, and um, came to me, they had had an explant. Now, for everybody on Facebook Live, if, if you have a periareolar incision, an incision around the circle, you cannot do an explant through that incision. Explants either have to be done under the breast in the fold or through a vertical. And probably most people don't do verticals. I do a lot of them because I do reductions, lifts at the same time, as well as fat transfer. So the lady who came to see me had a periareolar incision, only a small one. There's no way under any circumstances she had her capsule removed. So when you have that, I know for sure you have the same exact problem you had before because removal of the device doesn't eliminate the problem. She had a ruptured silicone device. So she invariably has capsule impregnated with silicone left inside of her chest cavity or in her uh, breast pocket. And so I've had to take people back to the OR and use something that's a temporary sizer like we use in cancer reconstruction, fill it with saline because that'll make it more like a little disc and take the capsule out again that was left behind because it's still there and it can contribute to symptoms because if in fact it had biofilm, a significant amount of biofilm and they didn't address it, then it's still there. It's not gone. You took the device out, but you left the bacteria there. Wow. So for those of you watching, the capsule is what develops right around it, around it. Yeah. And does it have its own blood source? A little bit. I don't know enough about this. So it's a scar. It's a scar. Okay. So it develops. So we you guys, we have a tremendous amount of comments on here. Um, Okay, this is a great question, Joy, a great question. If we have implants and don't feel like we have any problems, should we still get them removed? No, no. I mean, this is a surgical process that's very extreme the way I have to do it. And if there's not a specific issue, if, you know, quote unquote, there's no symptoms, um, if you have a, a, a smooth device, and you're being followed by your surgeon, you know, like I follow my people at three, six, nine, 12 months. I see them annually after that. I mean, the big thing is follow up. So I, I never saw this problem in my um, my practice as, as I matured because I think I saw everybody so frequently. And then I had a breast cancer patient come to me who I had put implants in for their reconstruction because that was basically you have to do a shared decision-making process in cancer and make sure that all avenues of reconstruction are completely explained and then reach the, you know, shared decision like, oh, this is what I want. This best fits me right now. And so this patient I had, I had put her implants in and, you know, she developed firmness. It wasn't comfortable. And, and so I, I, I said, you know, I'll, I'll get these out. There's nothing, you know, that I can say otherwise, but if there's not a specific issue, if you're not having the, the quote unquote fatigue, uh, increased anxiety, arthralgias, myalgias, uh, headache, back pain, neck pain, uh, reproductive issues, hormone imbalance, these things that are 
that I view as autoimmune, you know, basically they're being started by the process. Now, if those start to happen, then you have to address it and, and, and think critically about what you're doing. Are you are you going to hurt yourself? I think you're at your question is the root cause is, am I hurting myself by having this? And I, I can't say that. Uh, obviously, Danny mentioned there's a lot of folks who have implants who do really, really well. So um, it, it's more of a, a case by case for me. Um, Amen. People, people are super selective who come to see me. They're not coming to get a pat on the back. They're coming to get a real answer. So um, I have a real selection bias in my clients. They're coming after finding me or getting referred to me. So I don't see a bunch of people who don't have a problem for screening. I, I see a bunch of people who come in and they're, they're like, could this be the problem? And I go through the consultation. I go through the process with them and try to give them the best uh, information to make that decision. That's right. And that's what Dr. Bergdorf here in Nashville says. He says, you know, I can't guarantee all your symptoms that this is the problem. I can't say it's not. He said, I can guarantee you're going to be a lot smaller when I'm finished with surgery, you know, but he said the majority of all the patients feel, feel, you know, so much better. And no, you can't guarantee it. But, you know, I agree, Maria, the immune system doesn't like implantable devices. Symptoms are not probably you have a foreign object in your body. And again, everyone's different. Many people don't, don't react. I had an IUD years ago, a copper IUD, and I don't have very many sensitivities things. I do have lupus. Let me tell you, that was the most, that was an expensive journey. I had that in for two months and I nearly bled to my body, hated it, hated it, wanted yeah. it out. I had it out immediately taken out in the emergency room. So, um, and this happens with all implantable devices. You, you bet. You bet. Everyone is different. So, um, Chelsea, I will answer the question about that when we get off here about local doctors since. Um, OK, what else? Is there anything now? This is this Darlene. This is horrifying to me. I've had mine replaced three different times in a matter of 10 years. The last ones were called the gummy bears. I only had them in, in a year and my left breast started swelling. I immediately went to the surgeon and had them removed. However, they did not remove the capsule, only the implant. I'm still suffering from poor gut health, joint pain and depression. What can I do to detox? So you have three sets of capsules. So if they did two, I'd have to look at the history, but invariably there was a site change. So that means they went from one pocket to a different pocket. So there's capsule above and below the muscle and there's layers of capsule. So you have to take those things out. If in fact, you know, the way I hypothesize this is if you had biofilm in any of those pockets, it's still right there. And so just like you had a little boil that it was never drained, it's an infection. And so your body knows that's an infection. It's constantly trying to fight it. So when you talk about oxidative stress, mitochondrial stress, core problems with detoxification from glutathione or methylation issues, your body's burdened greatly to, to manage that. And because they took out the device, they didn't take out the actual layers that are around so, and traditional teaching would never have said to do that. I was not taught that way, but I've had to adapt. And, and in every situation now, I do an M-block capsulectomy. Now, not in every situation can you actually do that. The capsule has to be thick enough in order to work with. So if it's just completely transparent, like a wet piece of toilet paper or cellophane, I will tell you all, I'm an honest person. I'll come out of the OR and tell you that people who write that they do an M block every single time are just lying to you because they can't. I can tell you that they're also the same people that write their microsurgeons or you need a micro technique to do this surgery, which is stupid because I'm actually a microsurgeon and you don't need a microscope to do this. So the things that are written, honestly, a lot of them are to play up to and get clients and they're they're not really what I would consider the appropriate way to go about it. So, you know, scientifically, I think we have some good data to support, at least in my audit, you know, what we're uh, seeing. And then we definitely see improvement after explant. And 
I, I, I basically, I'll tell Danny what I do and I'll tell you all what I do. If I can't get anybody to see the nutritionist, everybody gets put on a gluten-free, dairy-free diet two weeks before surgery, six weeks after surgery, and they're put on 100 grams of protein. And I try not to burden people with what the source needs to be, but if you can listen or learn from Danny, they'll, they'll all tell you that animal sources can be more inflammatory than a plant-based source, especially pork. So I tell all my people, don't eat pork. It's a dirty animal. And bacon's great, but not after surgery. Bacon's great, but not after surgery. That could be a bumper sticker. Uh, yeah. So, okay, that's fantastic. So, guys, you all are you all are blowing this up, and I am so excited. And Karen, um, waking up cured is misleading. Just glad my pain is yeah. decreased, and I'm actually sleeping. Absolutely. You know, yeah. it takes and. Uh, Misha had hers out nine days ago. They look better now than they did before. And I'm only nine days post-op. I'm so Good. proud of you. Okay. Look at this. I just fell and my right implant became detached at the top. I wonder if it broke. Do you, no, typically you not. That's the capsule tearing. It's not the implant breaking. Okay. Okay. I implants that are saline just go flat. And saline or silicon devices that rupture usually have to have a big D cell injury, like a car accident, or they're old, or, or something else has to happen to actually make it happen. The, the implants nowadays are really sturdy. Becky, yes, dental implants can. Yes, they can. And I'm going to tell you all something. You all don't know this, but tomorrow morning, I have to go under general anesthesia to have a dental implant. Um, I have an infection under an impl two implants that I don't know about. I didn't know, but I could tell there was a little something, nothing hurts. I went to my dentist. He said, oh Lord, I've had them for nine years. I've never had any problems, but whatever reason I'm with a periodontist tomorrow morning, they had to reschedule 15 patients or something crazy. And, um, oh. but this is a prime example of what you were talking about, not knowing. But he said, Danny, there's pus under there. I didn't know. There's no pain. He, they took x-ray. He said, you have a true infection. And I'm probably going to need a graft. I'm going to, I don't know. Tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, you guys say a prayer because I don't like being under anesthesia ever. Although it's great sleep. I mean, I love that, but I don't let's, like being. Let's expand on this because one of my, I didn't mention this. So when people come to me with refractory UTIs, I test their urine with a PCR. One of my best, cleverest things ever is a Prevotella UTI, which is. In the mouth. Basically what you're talking about, because you're seeding your bloodstream with that. And that goes to your breast implant or your dental or your hip implant or your knee implant. That's exactly how people get infected. Wow. I didn't know I learned something new. Rhonda, good for you. Isn't that incredible? Dr. Whitfield, let me tell you, how could your organization, your certifying board, not hear this and see this and understand, again, not everyone is sick, but do they recognize this? I yeah, know you're I, a disruptor. You're a true disruptor in the industry. But I think at the, FDA, at the FDA hearings, I mean, it was it was made with the public testimony and everything really obvious, right? So if you can get cancer, yes, and some of the cancer may come from bacteria, that's a big deal. You bet it is. But of course, we uh, haven't moved a whole lot forward, have we? Um, since that, because we had COVID. COVID, COVID has screwed up a number of things and um, you would have not the answers because I've probably given you more answers tonight than you would ever got from any of the sub, any of the studies I've helped, you know, support and fund. But the, the, you know, the patient selection, you know, obviously, okay, so someone's 34, had two kids, comes in to me and we'll say, for instance, once a breast rejuvenation tummy tuck, mommy, mommy makeup, do her health history. And she already has, and is demonstrating signs of autoimmune. That person's a no-go. So they need to be instructed like, okay, 
what in your health history has led to you having this? Do you have a, a, a gut dysfunction problem? What is, what is your problem? What's, what's the issue with you? Now, I tell people no a lot. And, you know, it's, most doctors uh, in my position won't because that's a, a questionable thing to do if your living's made by doing that. Yep. Um, so if you're a surgeon, you want to operate. And the, the, the question is always, should you operate, not can you operate? So you have to answer that question first and foremost. So if I get somebody coming or somebody calling my wife asking about implants and they got all this autoimmune stuff already, I tell them, no, because you're a problem. You already got problems. You should go you're see Danny. <laughs> yeah. That's called practicing with integrity. And my office staff, we talk about this often because I also have a supplement store, which is also controversial with the practice. But I tell those girls in that store and I tell those girls, we practice with integrity here because people are desperate and people are desperate to have breast implants for various reasons. Um, and you must practice with integrity because if you do the right thing, you'll get your bills paid. The money will still come. I mean, you will you will get your bills. But if you do the right thing, not everyone is a fit for us. Not everyone needs every vitamin known to man. You do what needs to be done and then you go on from there. That's called that's a surgeon with integrity. And I think that that's hard to find. Uh, not I just think it's hard to find. And so. OK, Judy, your implants are 48 years old. Good Lord. I'm only 55 or I'm 55. They're almost as old as me. Now, that's interesting. Do you see that very often? Implants that age? Yeah. And she probably is the least symptomatic of the crew because she's yeah. probably got old ruptured gels and they're encrusted in something like like an egg shell. So a really old device from Dow Corning, the original implants will rupture because the shell integrity was not engineered to last hardly at all, really. Um, and you'll precipitate that into the, the pocket. And then those were usually put above the muscle and you'll get a really bad reaction to the tissues and you'll get a really firm, hard capsular contracture. That's so those where are they're like the easiest to take out. up there. Easy yeah. to get out though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, They'll I went great. twice to have implants put in back in my 30s. And Dr. Ward said, I'm not putting those in. You need to gain 20 pounds because I'm like a double A. And all I wanted was a B cup. And he said, nobody wants a B cup. I said, I do. I just want a little B. He said, Danny, if I put them in, you're going to encapsulate like oranges. You have got to gain 20 pounds. I said, well, screw that. I'm not gaining 20 pounds to get right. to have B cups. So I um, Pathology back yet, but they are very calcified. 22 years. Have you seen saline calcified implants pathology tests come back positive? I don't know. Positive for what? Cancer? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But. Oh, you, you know, oh, in terms of bacterial uh, DNA testing? Sure, of course. I, I have every freaking implant known to man come back, and I have. I have implants from Europe and South Africa and Australia and because Austin's a international city. I have people from all over the place show up. Yes, Karen, I agree. Well, I missed my thermography appointment with Victoria mm -hmm. Bailey. So I, yeah, I'm sure it's there. Um, when I move and stretch in certain directions, it feels like my implant is stuck. Like when you have a cramp in your toe, it's very painful. What? It's the, it's the capsule on the ribs. The capsule on the ribs. And is there anything you can do about that? Removal. No. Removal is the only thing. And if you have a lot of people have a wicked nerve pain. So the 12th nerve gives sensation to the nipple. It rides through the axilla, comes across the rib cage. Implants that are pushing, pushing out into the armpit, like the bad placement where when you lie down, it goes to your armpit. Oh, Those put Lord. a great deal of stress on the 12th intercostal nerve. That's why people have nerve pain in their nipple. They wake up at night with nerve pain. You may have itching, scratchiness, deep kind of itching. That's all nerve, nerve pain. 
Okay, there was a question up here that you will be able to answer. And she asked about itching, if your implants could cause itching. Yeah. Itching, itching. Uh, instructing patients, I love this doctor. So do I. Can't you see why I like canceled everything and brought him on in two weeks? Because he's he's fantastic. And we've already gone an hour here. We will answer your questions off the Facebook page and he can answer you know, anything he wants. Here's his information right here. Let me hide this comment. There's his information is take a picture of that. But Dr. Whitfield, tell us, is there anything, what do you have going on? What can they, you have a podcast, correct? Right. Tell us so, how to get in touch with you. Right. So our podcast, we'll put the link up on my Facebook page, go to Dr. Robert Whitfield. And then my website is drrobertwhitfield.com. But we have a podcast, scientific and holistic. And then more and more, uh, I've been asked to appear on podcasts discussing BII. Um, but I want you all to know that I, I discuss it very specifically and try to apply as much science to it as possible. We had a great discussion over the weekend in Scottsdale, and we need more dispassionate discourse, not impassioned arguments. So I just want everybody to get taken care of to the best of my ability. Amen. Amen. And, you know, he is, um, some of you can't get to Austin. Okay. So answer this, say the person can't travel. Where is the best resource for people to find a local surgeon? Do you know, do you have any idea? Is there any sort of resource? On Nicole's website, she has, uh, recommended surgeons. Now, yes. sometimes you find me on there because she likes me and sometimes I'm not on there because she doesn't. So, <laughs> but yeah. they have geographically uh, a, a lot of doctors. There are a lot more providers. Like when I first started six years ago, seven years ago, there was like 20 and now there's probably 120. So it's much better. Um, you can also go into and see if the the patients of the doctor have started their own group to comment on, you know, did, what was the experience like with the team? I have a great team. I have a very dedicated group of people. Um, you know, we try to, you know, just treat everybody with, you know, as much patience and grace as possible because these are all difficult. You know, everything's difficult. We understand that. So, you bet. Um, I, and I take care of colleagues, patients who need help. All I ask is that you come to the office. We're just trying to help you. Just be nice. Don't don't be rude. Don't be rude. That's right. Kindness is king over here. That's right. These people loved this. And guys, he's got a fantastic website, a great podcast. Check him out. And Judy, you um, thank you for being on here tonight and share this with your tribe for sure share this with your people really great information on breast implant and illness and healing by nicole yes they do have a good she does have a whole lot of information amen to that so i agree but thank you for taking your sunday night away from your family here to discuss this i know it's passionate i guys he has a fantastic instagram he's funny as hell too by the way this is a funny guy i i I see so much of Jackson, my son, and most of this tri tribe knows Jackson in him. And I can't wait to see what Jackson ends up doing in medical school um, yeah, because he reminds me a lot of you. And he, you know, he always wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. That's where he uh -huh. got his first experience in the operating room with one of our surgeons here in town. But he worked with me for a year in the office and he's, I, I have a feeling he said he really may just be internal medicine which and, and come back and do what I do and do what That'd I do. That'd be great. Yeah, I know. I know. You'll have a yeah, much better lifestyle than I have. Yes. Amen to that. Yes. So, <laughs> um, all right, my friends, listen, there's no Sunday night service the next two weeks because the book is coming out. November the 9th, and it has gone back and forth. Number one, number two, number one, number three on Amazon new release, but no Sunday night service because I'm trying to get my act together and I'm on a multiple podcast the next several weeks. But this is the beauty of this book coming out. So my publisher allowed me to do a 99 cent ebook promotion mm -hmm. for five days, five days. It starts tomorrow morning on Amazon. Now the book is available everywhere, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, but 
99 cents tomorrow. The book is not shipped to you. It You won't receive the book until November the 9th, but you can get the book for 99 cents, which does count towards bestseller status. By the way, you can read a few chapters and leave a review, an honest review. If you don't okay. like it, then that's fine. Share it. Say you don't like it. You know, Danny's full of crap. And um, this inflammation thing is all a myth. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, tomorrow morning, every one of you all listening, I need you to go on 99 cents, download the ebook. You don't have to have a Kindle. I don't have a Kindle and read a few chapters and leave a review on Amazon because that really helps. You guys have taken this book number one multiple times on Amazon. Now we can get it to the Wall Street Journal or New York Times or whatever. I, I need that's the goal. You know, it's a great it's a, it's a great movie. book, too. And Danny signed the copy for me that I got in Scottsdale. He got a copy Thank you. and he carried it around. I saw him. I was like, oh my Lord, he's probably like this. I got to carry this big ass book around. I watched him. He had it behind his back. One time he was holding it, talking to people, you know, he was moving it around. I thought, mm -hmm. bless his heart. He's carrying this book around. <laughs> Thank you. Read a chapter or something. And then, you know, my mother-in-law took it from me. Who? My mother-in-law. <laughs> she did? It was visiting. <laughs> she took Good. It. You, uh, you go order it on Amazon tomorrow morning for 99 cents and leave me a little bit of review. But guys, I'll be in Paducah at a book signing November the 6th. I'll be at Branch Out and we're going to be talking about Branch Out them. And then I'm going to be doing a book signing and answering your questions. And then November the 8th in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So anyway, it's exciting times. November the 11th in the office is the actual official book release party. Anybody who's Within two hours, three hours, show up here and come see me and we'll have a book signing if you want your book signed and we'll have a little wine and all that good stuff. So I am so excited. Thank you for being here. Have a fabulous night. I'm sorry, guys, we ran over, but this is such important information. And uh, Dr. Whitfield, you just simply answer questions whenever you can off your Facebook page. OK. OK. Appreciate Thanks, you, guys. You all have a good night and meal prep it's already seven o'clock in in nashville but meal <laughs> prep remember you cheat when you're not prepared so meal prep get your lunch ready for tomorrow that's right <laughs>